I entitled this presentation Building on a Mission of Remembrance, George C. Marshall at the American Battle Monuments Commission, uh, 1946 to 59. Uh, entitled it Building on a Mission of Remembrance because uh, as the second chairman of the American Battle Monuments Commission, General Marshall came into um, the work of the commission uh, after it had been uh, well in progress. The agency actually dates from 1923, so its own centennial is coming up in, in a mere four years. I'm sure some kind of preparations are, are underway for that. But uh, the agency was created to memorialize the soldiers who fought and many of whom died in the First World War, memorialize them in permanent cemeteries of which eight were created at the end of World War I, and 11 monuments that were created at the end of World War I as well. And not only is the agency devoted to memorializing uh, the sacrifice of American soldiers in overseas wars, but its mission today is a little broader than that. Really, it's to promote remembrance and to do honor to all those who have served, worn the uniform um, in America's wars, uh, both those who died, but also uh, those who fought and survived and are many of whom still living as veterans. General John J. Pershing was the first chairman of the ABMC. Uh, he took over actually in 1924 in that role and served for the better part of a quarter of a century until his death in 1948. General Marshall was elected chairman of the agency in January of 1949. And many of you, I'm sure, know that General Pershing was to a very real degree one of General Marshall's most important mentors. And I suspect that President Truman had that in mind uh, when he appointed General Marshall to the ABMC. Actually, Marshall's uh, initial membership was that of one of 11 members. The ABMC is, is two things. I should probably clarify that. One, it's an agency of the federal government, a very small agency, but it's got this very hallowed mission, as I just described it of promoting remembrance of uh, our soldiers and especially our soldier dead. But it's also uh, a commission, kind of an oversight board, um, to which presidents appoint members. There's a permanent secretary and a permanent chairman. And there are now, what, 10 members on the commission, I believe. But originally, there were seven appointed at the end of World War I, or when the agency was founded in 1923. And at the end of World War II, the agency was expanded, or the commission itself was expanded, to 11 members to make room for World War II veterans, since the original seven, or they weren't the original, but the seven who were members uh, coming out of the war had been appointed earlier. So their service could carry over, then four new members were added. And General Marshall was appointed in October of 1946, became chairman uh, two and a half years later. You all know, I suspect, that being on the American Battle Monuments Commission, even as chairman, was not the only thing that General Marshall was doing during those uh, late years of the 1940s into the early 1950s. And this is one of the major differences. I'm going to be uh, offering a, a kind of comparison of uh, General Pershing's service as ABMC chairman and that of General Marshall in, in the course of my talk. But the first thing to say is that whereas, and I argue this in my book, whereas John J. Pershing's service to the ABMC over the last quarter century of his life was the most important outlet for Pershing to continue uh, serving his country. It was the only major job that he had after he retired as Army Chief of Staff in 1924. He devoted the best years of his public service in that final quarter century of his life to the ABMC, and he left a, a very large imprint on everything from the work of the commission and how the work is done, how it's organized, 
to the actual design and the uh, building of the World War I monuments and cemeteries. The fact that there are crosses and stars of David, for example, religious symbols marking the graves in the ABMC cemeteries to this day has everything to do with General Pershing. The original plan for those overseas cemeteries was that they were to look like little Arlingtons. And the headstones would have been much different. Those of you who know what the headstones look like in Arlington, there's wide variation for one thing. There are monuments uh, in the Arlington Cemetery. But the ordinary headstones, such as the one that's over General Pershing's own grave, um, do not look like the headstones depicted in the pamphlet that uh, we've handed out to you. I often show slides with this presentation, but chose not to do that uh, tonight simply because, as I said, General Marshall really didn't have that much to do with the design of the World War II cemeteries. But I wanted you to see uh, in the World War II section, particularly of this pamphlet, what those sites look like. And any of the cemeteries, there were 14 cemeteries created after World War II. And in the World War II section of that pamphlet, which uh, we owe our thanks to uh, Mike and the ABMC for providing, uh, you get, there's a good picture from each of the sites. Anything labeled cemetery in the World War II chapter, that's one of the 14. Um, that General, whose construction General Marshall presided over, but didn't necessarily influence in the same way that General Pershing influenced the design and creation of the World War I cemeteries. But uh, so Pershing was a, a very hands-on chairman because the work was being done for the first time. And it was very interesting when the World War I memorials and cemeteries were dedicated in 1937, the belief was that the ABMC might even go out of business because it had fulfilled its mission. And the hope really that everyone had was that we would never have another war like the First World War. For us it was the war of 1917-18. But uh, alas, in 1939, two years after the cemeteries were dedicated, uh, World War II came along, and we got into it, and by 1945, planning was already underway for a second generation of sites. But uh, when, when Pershing was chairman, everything was being done for the first time. And coming out of the Second World War, the same patterns, basic design of the cemeteries, all the artwork and whatnot, chapels, are unique in each of the World War II cemeteries, but they adhere to a, a very similar pattern, at least to the way that the World War I cemeteries were designed. Another big difference, though, is that after World War I, 11 different monuments were created on sites outside of the cemeteries. In some cases, or most cases, two, three, four, five, six, eight miles from the cemeteries. Separate monuments were created. At the end of the war Second World War, the ABMC decided that the cemeteries themselves would be sort of inclusive memorials. So that, for those of you who, how many of you have ever been to Normandy, for example? So you know there you not only see the very expansive burial grounds with more than 9,300 individual graves, but you also see a very impressive statuary, a memorial, a monument, the statue of youth rising from the waves, supposed to depict the spirit of American youth, the spirit of the youth who came ashore on June 6, 1944 and climbed the bluffs and literally crossed the ground of the cemetery on their way to liberating France and, and ultimately uh, Western Europe. The chapel is there, and there are also battle maps surrounding the statue in the memorial area of the cemetery. Well, you don't see that to the same degree in the World War I sites. The, the battle maps, the, the explanation of the military action that occurred tends to be on the World War I monuments, not in the cemeteries. But the World War II sites are a little more comprehensive, if you will. That decision, by the way, um, was made in 1947. I believe General Marshall was in the room 
Now, when that decision was made, he was just a member of the commission. He was one of the four new members appointed by President Truman to get the contingent up to 11, but he was not yet the chairman. Pershing remained chairman, uh, as I said, until his death in July of 1948, but Pershing was unable to attend any of the 10 meetings that were held between the end of World War II and his own death. Vice chairman by the name of Robert Woodside presided over the meetings. Marshall attended two of those meetings. When he became chairman in January of 1949, there were 18 more meetings between 49 and General Marshall's death in October of 1959. General Marshall presided over 11 of them, but he had to miss uh, a number of the others for, for various reasons. There are a couple of other uh, differences between the way General Pershing served as chairman and General Marshall did. Pershing made annual inspection tours of the memorial sites while they were under construction, even after they were built. In fact, uh, his last inspection tour was in the summer of 1939. He sailed home about the second week in August, Pershing did, and you know your chronology of World War II, Germany attacked Poland on the 1st of September, so that's the margin by which Pershing escaped the actual outbreak of World War, I, uh, World War II. But he was that committed, Pershing was, to seeing to it that the memorials were done the way he wanted them to be done, and once done, that they were maintained the way he wanted them to be maintained. Pershing talked about my soldiers. He had a deep kinship with the soldiers who had fought for him in World War I and maintaining very close supervision and, and leadership over the creation of the memorial sites was one of the ways that he could do them the kind of ongoing honor. So he took that very seriously. The other Marshall never made annual inspection trips. In fact, he only visited the American sites twice while he was a member of the commission. And I don't mean that in, in any disparaging way. As I've said, he had other things to do, but I think he also trusted Marshall did. Um, the other members of the commission, especially uh, there was a very fine secretary of the commission by the name of Thomas North, who was appointed to that office in the spring of 1946, he more closely supervised the actual creation of the sites. But Marshall visited the World War I sites in 1948 when he was in Europe to uh, for keep an eye on the Greek Civil War that was underway then. Marshall was Secretary of State uh, in 1948 when he made that visit. And then in 1952, he was back in Europe for the one dedication of a World War II site, which was in fact originally a World War I site, uh, you can find Suren, S-U-R-E-S-N-E-S, -E -E in your site booklets there. It's listed in the World War I section. But the site was expanded to make it a, a shrine, basically, for both world wars. And Marshall went over in September of 1952 to preside over the dedication of that site. I'll tell you more about uh, what he said on that occasion and what that particular ceremony uh, represented uh, later on. But in connection with that visit, he traveled to some of the other World War II sites, many of which were still incomplete. But in the course of that visit, Mrs. Marshall was with him, Catherine Tupper Marshall, his second wife, and her youngest son, Alan Brown, had been killed uh, in the fighting in Italy on the, the path to Rome in the spring of 1944. And in 1952, General Marshall and Mrs. Marshall were able to visit the permanent grave of that young man in the Sicily Rome Cemetery. Marshall wrote a very tender letter to a, a lady who had written to him about four years later inquiring about, this, this was a woman whose own uh, son was buried abroad and she was asking General Marshall about uh, what the sites looked like and he was able to relate to her in a very personal way.
uh, having a stepson actually in uh, that Sicily Rome cemetery. So, but whereas Pershing had participated in several of the dedications of the World War I cemeteries, Marshall only participated in, in that one. And Marshall never lived to see the completion of all the sites, which was another uh, rather important difference between his own connection with the ABMC and General Pershing. Um, I want to talk about some of the specific contributions General Marshall made to the work of the ABMC, and I, I will do that in a little more detail, but I, I want to make at least one more preliminary observation. This is something that, that has come to fascinate me the deeper I've gotten into this, this whole study. Both Pershing and Marshall were retirement age, basically, when they undertook their service to the American Battle Monuments Commission. Pershing was actually 64, you know, but he retired as Army Chief of Staff and then, and then worked for the commission. General Marshall was between his 65th and 66th birthdays when he was appointed to the commission, and then he served until uh, his death, uh, just shy of his 79th birthday in 1959. And it's, it struck me that what more noble kind of service can a former commander do? I know Marshall was never a battlefield commander, but as Army Chief of Staff in World War II, he's a five-star general, obviously. He was one of the most significant generals in, in all of American history. But what more noble service can retired generals give to their country than supervising the memorialization of the dead or the memorialization of the entire war effort in which they had played such an important part? Carlo Deste, who uh, has written biographies of some of the most important figures in our own military history, uh, in the biography of General Eisenhower that he wrote some years ago, said about Pershing that his most important legacy, in fact, was the work that he did with the American Battle Monuments Commission. I'm not about to argue that the work General Marshall did with the ABMC was the most important work he did because I think there was greater importance attached to his service as Army Chief of Staff, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, et cetera, et cetera. But it was still very noble and in its own way uh, important work as well. Here's what, uh, here's what I discovered about um, some of the specifics of General Marshall's activity with the American Battle Monuments Commission. In 1947, the spring of the year, uh, he attended two meetings of the commission, the only two he attended before he became chairman. And uh, there were very important issues being discussed, and one was the, one of them was the siting of the cemeteries. And the specific issue that Marshall weighed in on in a very uh, influential way was where were our cemeteries going to be in the Pacific theater? The ABMC had already been working on siting of the cemeteries, and they'd made a number of final decisions, but the decision over where to put the cemetery or these cemeteries in the Pacific was, was still hanging fire. General MacArthur had been contacted and MacArthur voted basically for a cemetery in Hawaii, which of course was a territory of the United States, not yet a state. But Marshall also said that there should be a cemetery in the Marianas, preferably on the island of Guam, and there should also be a cemetery in the Philippines. But the issue, of course, was how accessible were these cemeteries likely to be, and Marshall was, was willing to accept just one cemetery in Hawaii if the decision was that cemeteries elsewhere might be too inaccessible for people to visit, and also the 
families of the dead of World War II had not yet been fully heard from with regard to a decision that each of them got to make, namely whether their dead loved ones killed in action would be buried abroad or repatriated. And as it turned out, more than 60% at the end of each war, in more than 60% of the cases, the families decided they wanted the bodies brought home for burial somewhere in the United States. So that left between 30 and 40% uh, to be buried in permanent cemeteries overseas. But until the number was known, how many burials there would need to be overseas, then the decision was kind of left as to how many cemeteries there would be in the Pacific Theater. But General Marshall weighed in very heavily on the idea that we should have a cemetery in the Philippines. And his argument was that a permanent cemetery there would be a living reminder to the Filipino people about the willingness of American soldiers to sacrifice for the liberation of their country. And as it turned out, the cemetery created outside Manila has been, and probably always will be, the largest of all the overseas cemeteries. There are 17,000 plus individual burials there. And I think even more significantly, on the wall of the missing, every one of the cemeteries has a wall of the missing, where all those who were known to have died, but whose remains were never found, are listed. Uh, with the same information uh, that is inscribed in the headstones. Name, state, where they enlisted from, date of death, rank, and unit. And on the wall of the missing in the Philippines, there are 36,000 names, in addition to the 17,000 individual burials. Of course, what's responsible for that is the fact that in the tropics, so many uh, the bodies decompose so quickly and remains, if not retrieved, um, very soon after death. Um, they just decompose and are unidentifiable. But uh, the Manila Cemetery that Marshall argued so strenuously for in this early meeting in 1947 is the largest of all the ABMC uh, cemeteries. Um, he also was very determined, although he didn't get his way with this point, but Marshall remembered that at the end of World War I, the American Congress had appropriated money for Gold Star mothers to visit their son's graves, and it also was kind of a Gold Star widows uh, pilgrimage as well. Six or 7,000 American uh, widows and Gold Star mothers traveled to Europe from 1929 to 31 or 32, it was during the administration of President Hoover, right in the middle of the Depression, really, this money was appropriated to facilitate the visit of mothers and widows to the cemetery, six or 7,000. Marshall wanted the same program at the end of World War II, and he advocated for it as early as 1947. But he didn't get it. If you'll note, there was roughly a 10-year delay between the end of World War I and the first Gold Star Mother pilgrimage. That's because cemeteries weren't finished yet for them to go visit. It's kind of the same thing was true into the early 1950s. And by the time the cemeteries would have been finished for mothers and widows of the World War II dead to go visit, money wasn't available. In fact, by the early 1950s, this is another way that General Marshall is going to play an important role in the work of the ABMC. Money wasn't even available as plentiful as needed in the early 1950s to pursue the construction program of the cemeteries. A very simple reason for that, the outbreak of war in Korea in June of 1950. But Marshall proved a, a very important and very uh, adept advocate for the ABMC in the ongoing budgetary wars as well. Because once the cemetery construction got underway, Marshall was very sensitive to 
the reality that thousands of families, family members of the dead, were likely to make the trip to Europe to see the grave of their loved one. And to the degree that the construction was unfinished, these people were not going to have the, the kind of experience that Marshall thought they deserved. They, they were going to see piles of dirt. They were likely not going to see a permanent headstone mounted. Um, chapels were not going to be finished. Uh, and of course, I mean, this is, this is inevitable. The cemeteries couldn't be built overnight. But Marshall was all in favor of pushing the construction at the, the most energetic pace possible. And when the Korean War broke out and money tightened to the point that the ABMC construction program needed to be pared down and delayed, Marshall got very upset. And he was also upset by personnel reductions that were necessitated by the restriction of funds due to the uh, great needs of the Korean War. One of the other takeaways that, that I've had from my own research is back in the 1940s, 1950s, earlier even into the 60s, it was as if it pained the United States government to spend a thousand dollars. And uh, the ABMC was very, very frugal, uh, penny pinchers almost, but now you it's almost impossible to fathom a time when a thousand dollars or even a million dollars uh, would have been that precious to the government. Uh, it's, it's the simple issue, of course, is fiscal responsibility, which we don't seem to care that much about uh, anymore. But they did back then. And I want to read uh, the text of a letter, it's not very long, that General Marshall wrote to General Bradley. This was in March of 1951. And uh, there's, there's a lot of Marshall's character and humility in this particular intervention um, that he made with, with General Bradley. Bradley was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And Marshall was writing to him as chairman of the ABMC. He was also Secretary of Defense, though, when he wrote this letter. But, but note the tone of it. And he starts out, this is Marshall now, he said, in addition to my other duties, I still seem to be chairman of the American Battle Monuments Commission. That's what he wrote to Bradley. And then he continued. He said, my personal concern has mainly to do with the possible adverse reaction in the event this reduction in officer personnel creates conditions of poor maintenance in the existing cemeteries and poor supervision of construction work on our new cemeteries. The number of parents visiting our overseas cemeteries has been considerable during the past few years, and I anticipate no great reduction in those visiting this summer. This was in the summer of 1951. This was a year, by the way, when the uh, ABMC had been promised uh, 5.2 million dollars. Actually, that was their promised appropriation for fiscal year 1950. They'd been promised 8.5 million for fiscal year 1951 and another 12 million for fiscal year 1952. And each one of the appropriations that was finally made in each of those fiscal years was more than halved. So this is what Marshall is reacting to. General Bradley suggested that he write to General Joseph McNarney, who was chairman of the management committee uh, for the Defense Department. So here's what Marshall wrote to General McNarney, who was another officer with whom Marshall was very familiar from earlier service. I'm naturally hesitant to become personally involved in individual personnel problems. But, in this case, am deeply concerned about the overall morale factor if our foreign national cemeteries are not adequately maintained, and if the long-range program for construction at and improvement in our World War II cemeteries is postponed or otherwise 
interfered with. Offhand, notice I'm naturally hesitant to interfere, or offhand, I'm inclined to think that we should, if anything, increase the personnel assigned to the Battle Monuments Commission overseas. Five days later, he heard back from McNarney, and the number of officers from Army, Air Force, and Navy detailed to the commission more than doubled. So I wrote in the book plainly, it did not hurt the American Battle Monuments Commission that George C. Marshall was the chairman. But I think in, in some degree we can take at face value what he says about his own disinclination to play the George C. Marshall card, so it seemed, in these, these budget fights. But nonetheless, he was committed to uh, getting what he thought his agency needed, and he was largely uh, successful. Another issue that he got involved with was uh, the placement of George Patton's grave in the uh, Luxembourg Cemetery. How many of you ever have been there and seen? So you know General Patton's grave, and, and we all sort of marvel at this and are inclined uh, not to question it. And I don't necessarily mean to suggest that it should be questioned. But the fact of the matter is, the isolated nature of Marshall's, uh, excuse me, Patton's grave just separated not even 10 yards from the body of the rest of the dead in the cemetery is unique. There's no other grave that has been given that kind of special standing. And General Marshall and the commission actually fought the idea that Patton should be buried in, in that kind of a, a special spot, separated, not distant from, but still separated from the body of the troops. This was all sorted out in the late 1940s. Patton was buried in the Luxembourg Cemetery um, immediately upon his death uh, in December of 1945. That's where he wanted to be with his troops. He was initially buried amidst the whole body of their more than 5,000 now in the permanent cemetery. Luxembourg was a temporary cemetery when Patton was put in there. He was right in the middle of the, the ranks. But the complaint was that there was so much eagerness to visit Patton's grave, and in the winter weather and spring rains and what have you, the cemetery got quite muddy. The Grand Duchess of Luxembourg, I remember being told once, complained that she had to walk so far to decorate Patton's grave. So he was moved to the front row a couple years later, around 1947. But then in 1949, the family of General Patton put pressure on the new Secretary of War, who was a man named, or Secretary of Defense, a man named Lewis Johnson. And uh, they put pressure on him to be moved into sort of a special spot. And Secretary Johnson approached the ABMC and asked, okay, what do, you, what do you folks think of this idea? And the commission unanimously, with General Marshall speaking for it, said, we don't like the idea because our cemeteries maintain no distinction based on rank, um, race. The cemeteries were the World War I cemeteries, again, were one of the few aspects of military life that was not racially segregated, in fact. So we don't want Patton put in this special spot. But Secretary Johnson went ahead and did it anyway, because the cemetery was still under the jurisdiction of the Graves Registration Service of the Army, that's Defense Department. It was turned over to the ABMC at the end of 1949, but Patton's grave had already been moved. So then the question is, are we going to leave him there or not? And this issue kind of hung fire for four or five years until finally in 1954. And all that time, Patton's grave had no permanent headstone. But in 1954, General Marshall agreed and the commission agreed, all right, we're not going to dither about this anymore. We'll leave Patton where he is. And he got his permanent headstone. But again, his is the only grave of that sort in any of the ABMC cemeteries from, from either war. Um, 
I want to talk to you. I've, I've described basically behind the scenes uh, activity by General Marshall in the life of the ABMC thus far. But I, I want to conclude with his two most public uh, bits of service, you might say, to the ABMC. Um, one of them was at the dedication of the Seren Cemetery in September of 1952. And the other was an article that General Marshall contributed to that appeared in National Geographic magazine in June of 1957, which was only two and a half years before General Marshall died. And by 1957, he'd actually become too ill to attend any ABMC meetings. He attended his last meeting of the commission in December of 1956. And at that meeting, he was able to hear a report on the dedication of the first six of 14 World War II cemeteries that had occurred the previous summer. But General Marshall had not been able to attend any of those dedications himself. But in June of 1957, this article appeared in the National Geographic, and it was a complete summary filled with photographs and stories about the creation of the 14 new World War II memorials. And his introduction to that piece was very touching. I'm going to read uh, an excerpt from it. But I want to talk first about uh, the dedication of the Seren site in September 1952. It was actually on the 13th of September, which would have been the 92nd birthday of General Pershing, uh, if Pershing had still been alive. But Seren is in the suburbs of Paris. Have any of you ever been there by any chance? It's a beautiful site. It's on a hill called Mount Valerien. It's in the west of the city and from our cemetery, which Woodrow Wilson originally dedicated on Memorial Day 1919. You can, it's a beautiful view of the Eiffel Tower and, and the Paris sky, skyline. It's a stunning sight. The French gave us the ground. And the decision was made after World War II to expand that site to include 24 un, the graves of 24 unknowns from World War II, in addition to the 1,500 burials from World War I. And the chapel was enlarged so that at each end of it, there was a loggia that did honor to the dead from both world wars, so that this could be kind of a comprehensive shrine, if you would, to both world wars, the American soldiers who served in both. General Marshall made the trip to Europe and presided over the, uh, the ceremony. But he declined to give the dedicatory address. He got General Matthew Ridgway to do that. And uh, Ridgway, of course, had been, uh, Victor Davis Hanson calls Ridgway one of the savior generals uh, who had basically saved the uh, effort in Korea by that point. But uh, I, I saw a note that Ridgway had written to Marshall accepting Marshall's invitation to deliver the dedicatory address. And Ridgway said, I'll do this. It's not my usual thing. I'm, I'm paraphrasing liberally. But he said, it's, it's not my usual gig. But I'll do it, and I'll enjoy it, but only because you asked me to do it. Um, and Understand, we're seven years removed in September 1952 from the end of the Second World War. So memories of World War II are still very fresh. But we're in the Cold War. And the French Communist Party was very active. They were operating in the open, I mean, running candidates and, and securing rather large portions of the national vote. But by 1952, their policy, they had put up a clamor that Americans should go home just leave us alone. I mean, that was the party line from Moscow at that time, too. Stalin was still alive in September of 1952, mind you. But in the remarks that Marshall made um, at the beginning of the, the ceremony, he addressed that anti-American sentiment quite directly. And he said, basically, looking out on the dead, buried in the cemetery said, these guys can't go home. They'll never go home. 
And he said, basically, uh, as for us living Americans, we're not going to leave either until we are satisfied that freedom is secure in this country and everywhere else where we have a presence, because that's basically what we have been about in both world wars and in the aftermath as well. So he, he made very effective use of the occasion, I think, to promote uh, our overall foreign policy objectives. But they were objectives that could hardly be considered partisan, because Americans have historically always stood for the defense of freedom and freedom uh, far from our shores. To the National Geographic piece, uh, I want to quote a little more extensively from that, because to me, this is George C. Marshall speaking from his heart about what the overseas memorial sites meant to him, but also what he thought they should mean to all of us as well, to all Americans. So this is what, uh, some of what he wrote in this National Geographic article. Twice since World War II, my heart has led me on long pilgrimages overseas. I went as an old soldier seeking fallen comrades. The twice, I think, referred to the 48 and the 52 trips. The hours I walked among our lost legions were among the most poignant of my life. Each sight evoked old memories of decisions made, of battles waged and won, and above all, of the young Americans who paid the highest price that war can exact. Yet the tribute I gave these men in my thoughts must remain an unwritten one. For words cannot capture or convey gratitude held so deeply. In the course of my pilgrimages, there grew a very great, if melancholy, satisfaction in the work of the American Battle Monuments Commission, entrusted with the care of our war dead in foreign lands. We were keeping faith with the fallen. We were taking to them all that we could of home, of beauty, and of remembrance. The Commission's high task involves also a most solemn obligation to the living. I have corresponded personally with many Gold Star families concerning our work, but to write words of comfort and assurance to all is beyond my powers. Therefore, I would like to share with the bereaved and with all other Americans this brief account of a loving stewardship. When World War II ended, 15 million American men and women had answered the call to arms. Of these, 360,810 died overseas. Most of them were buried near where they fell, in temporary graves on alien soil. In the years that followed, more than half were brought back to their homeland at the request request of relatives. The Commission has labored unceasingly through the past decade in behalf of those left in our care. And today they all lie in permanent memorial cemeteries. We have established 14 of these World War II memorials abroad. But statistics, however meaningful, are poor fare for a troubled heart. It is only natural that some who left a loved one overseas should have moments of doubt concerning their decision. I know the assurance many families would have me give. Yes, he rests now in a serene and beautiful place, well planned, well built, and well kept by dedicated men. Yet I feel with equal conviction that the excellent care given our cemeteries and the distinguished memorials erected are not enough. Something more is needed, and only the public can give that. All of us are so greatly indebted to our thousands of fallen soldiers. In a higher sense, they are the sons of every free man. I've always loved that. Our fallen are the sons of every free man. Therefore, I ask each reader who can, not just the war bereaved, 
but any reader who can to visit the cemeteries and pay similar tribute. That is the something more needed. If you believe in a life of the spirit, as most Americans devoutly do, then you must believe these men want visitation. Without it, theirs would be a lonely vigil, one lacking the best evidence we could give of gratitude and steadfast memory. That's the mission, by the way, that the ABMC is continuously dedicated to. And I think Marshall gave a superb voice to that. Here's the resolution that the commission passed um, the day after his funeral in October of 1959 and just five days after he had passed away. Whereas his keen interest in the work of the commission and the leadership he gave to it in carrying out its responsibility for the design and construction of the magnificent cemeteries overseas in which more than 80,000 of the heroic dead of World War II lie buried and for the design and construction of the imposing monuments commemorating the sacrifices and achievements of the American armed forces in that conflict contributed in great measure to the high praise which has come to the commission and to the government and whereas we, his fellow members of the commission, held him in the deepest esteem for his always tactful but nevertheless positive direction of our deliberations and recall with prideful memory our association with him, be it resolved that we do hereby record our profound sorrow in his passing and extend to his family and to the nation which he served so well in this and in many other positions of high trust our heartfelt sympathy. Chairman of the American Battle Monuments Commission was the last official office or official role that George C. Marshall played. And I think it's an immense credit to the country that it saw fit to call this great servant in so many other ways to this final position of the highest responsibility. Thank you very much.